Hello and welcome to the sixth annual Analytic Theology Lecture at AAR. This lecture series is sponsored by the Center for Philosophy of Religion at the University of Notre Dame. I'm Michael Ray, uh, the director of that center. Today's lecture will, as usual, be followed by a reception from 4.30 until 6 o'clock, and that's just right next door in Salon B. Uh, all of you are welcome and encouraged to attend. Our speaker today is Sarah Coakley. She is the Norris Hulse Professor of Divinity at Cambridge University, and she has previously held positions at the University of Lancaster, Oxford, Harvard, and Princeton. She has been awarded honorary degrees by the University of Lund, the University of St. Andrews, General Theological, uh, the University of St. Andrews, General Theological Seminary, New York, and the University of Toronto. In 2012, she delivered the Gifford Lectures in Aberdeen and was also elected a member of the European Academy of Sciences and Arts. That was a nice year. <laughs> And from 2013 to 2015, she served as the president of the British Society for Philosophy of Religion. She was one of the contributors to the original analytic theology volume that Oliver Crisp and I edited. And with her doctoral and postdoctoral students, she has continued to participate in international colloquia related to that. The title of her talk today is Sin and Desire in Analytic Theology, A Return to Genesis 3. Please welcome Sarah Coakley. Well, it's wonderful to see so many people, but I hope you're not going to be too uncomfortable sweating away and thinking about a topic we are all deeply engaged in. So first, let me express my deep gratitude to Mike Ray and Samuel Newlands of the Center of Philosophy of Religion at Notre Dame for the honor of the invitation to give this year's analytic theology lecture on the topic of sin. During this last year, the center has already hosted its annual Logos Conference on the same theme. And this marks an important development in analytic reflection on this essentially theological topic, a topic up till now relatively subordinated to the overriding theodicy concern in the discourses of analytic philosophy of religion on the problem of evil as construed in the modern period. In what follows then, I shall first introduce what I want to say by reflecting briefly on how sin has characteristically been discussed up till now in analytic philosophy of religion, and what this might therefore leave still to be done. Then the rest of the lecture will proceed in three dialectical parts, in which my goal is to complexify, enrich, and to some extent disturb the ways the topic of sin is currently approached in that analytic philosophical discourse. My aim, of course, in this undertaking is to witness to the particular goals and significance of analytic theology as I understand it. That is, to draw classic theology in all its diverse forms, analytic philosophy, and analytic philosophy of religion into new and mutually generative relationship. In particular, I am interested in the relationship between sin and desire in the original biblical narrative, something fundamental to its structure, and a matter on which a number of classic Christian authors are particularly rich and interesting. Yet desire is a topic in which analytic philosophy has only recently evidenced some new fascination after long neglect. And the new convergence of interest on this theme may be revealing and fortuitous for our purposes, as I shall comment along the way, and particularly in closing. In the first substantive part of the lecture, then, what I call section two on your handout if you have one, I shall do my exegetical work first, by returning to some of the mysterious dimensions of the account of original sin in Genesis 3 and on, its, and on into the beginning of Genesis 4 with the Cain and Abel story. This undertaking will, to say the least, complicate the philosophical task of clarifying the nature of sin beyond what is usually assumed in the current philosophical literature. And please note that I am not assuming any fundamentalist commitments in thus turning back to the biblical text, but rather seeking to probe afresh the original nexus from which a remarkable variety of classic renditions took off. And here indeed, we shall not find any immediate answer to our philosophical questions, but rather a case of what Levi Strauss would have called the characteristically mythical mediation of unbearable contradictions in a narrative which irreducibly holds and yet also generates 
a plethora of further philosophical puzzles. In particular, what is sin exactly? What is its relation to human desire and human freedom? Why and how is evil already in the world at all in the person of the serpent at the start of this story? And why have Adam and Eve been given the particular prohibition that is presented to them? In other words, what seems to be an explanation of sin and evil in Genesis 3 is in fact a narrative generator of further philosophical aporiae. That is the very nature of this particular mythic narrative. And it is important first to acknowledge and understand that rather than resist or reduce it. In the next section, three, I shall wear my historical theologian's hat and reflect on how certain rabbinic and Christian responses to the problem of sin diverge dramatically in their resolution of these narrative aporiae. I shall choose to identify only three Christian strands of such interpretation in a rough typology. But each strand generates a further theodicy issue and a further set of philosophical problems. The lesson to be learnt here is that there seems to remain, in any rich theological interpretation of the narrative of Genesis 3, a profound element of divine mystery, even alongside the various dimensions of philosophical unsatisfactoriness which may seem to attend it. In the last section, I shall propose one possible philosophical or rather analytic theological solution to the difficulties, one that draws somewhat eclectically on the classic materials we have surveyed. My aim here is to throw particular contemporary light on the relation of desire, temptation, freedom, and sin, and thereby to construct a Felix Culpa rendition of the fall complementary to the usual Christological one known in the West from the time of Augustine. Let me dub this a double Felix Culpa alternative which involves the retrieval of an important strand in Anselm's thinking, not from the Cor Deus Homo, but from Anselm's rather neglected little text, De Caso Diaboli, on the fall of the devil, conjoined with some passing but rich insights from the East Syrian tradition on Genesis 3, and undergirded by a fundamentally Western scholastic construal of the nature of human freedom in relation to divine primary causation. For me, this rather strange amalgam will constitute the best probable possible rendition of Genesis 3 that attends sensitively to its crucial philosophical aporiae, and in particular its key focus on the relation between desire and sin, yet without reducing the final mystery of divine providence inherent in the narrative. This much then by way of orienting ourselves of what is to come, since I know in the dark halls of Hades, as I think of the AAR. <laughs> it's extremely hard to concentrate for more than five minutes, which is why I put my introduction at the beginning. <laughs> Let me now comment just briefly to complete the work of this introductory section on what analytic philosophy of religion has to date tended to say when confronting the problem of sin and the fall, for it is this that I seek to complexify and enrich. What we find here, I submit, is not any unanimous witness as such, except insofar as there are a tendency to rush quickly to the familiar difficulties of the modern problem of evil and its potential solution according to some version of the free will defense or a variation on it, and thus not to tarry as long as would be desirable with the demanding and puzzling question of what actually constitutes sin according to the biblical narrative. A fine programmatic article by the late Philip Quinn, Sin and Original Sin, may be indicative of these tendencies in analytic philosophy of religion. This wastes no time in providing a definition of sin out of the air as, quote, the concept of a human fault that offends a morally perfect God and brings with it guilt, in complete abstraction from the complications of the biblical narrative. It then moves fast to the Western Augustinian understanding of original sin and immediately declares it morally problematic from the perspective of modern Western sensibilities, Locke, Kant, Kierkegaard, or more recently, Richard Swinburne. The doctrine of original guilt is declared even more unacceptable. I quote, we are guilty only for our own morally evil actions, and so we acquire guilt only by committing personal sins, close quote. Quinn's article thus throws down a gauntlet from which other analytic philosophy of religion seem to scatter in various directions, albeit with a shared presumption 
that libertarian freedom of some sort must be defended to the hilt. Thus, Richard Swinburne's account of sin in his Responsibility and Atonement, Chapter 9, which preceded Quinn's article and is already commented on by him, takes an equally strong line against Augustinian original sin, largely because that abrogates what Swinburne already presumes as a supreme good, the human power for incompatibilist freedom, necessary as a first plank in any free will defense, as we know from Swinburne's other writings. Thus, Augustine is repudiated to core. I quote, there seems no reason whatever to adopt the Augustinian view, close quote. And Swinburne correlatively throws in his lot with what he calls, rather curiously, the liberal Greek-speaking theologians of the early centuries, whom he takes, we shall shortly see if this correct, as propounding some form of modern incompatibilism, the human power to determine our own destiny. In a form of radical human aseity, significantly diremt from the transcendent causal powers of the divine. To be sure, Swinburne is alert to modern evolutionary thinking in this mix, and hence does have something to say about desire, not, however, inspired directly by the biblical text, and he thinks it as passive and selfish, delivered by the evolutionary inheritance. This, however, despite being a complicated and countervailing factor, has no need to disturb the heroic capacity for individual free will in Homo sapiens. And sin, in contrast, is simply defined as a failure in a duty to God, conceived juridically, and again, without any direct reference to the biblical text. We might see Mike Ray's long recent article, marvelous article if you don't know it already, The Metaphysics of Original Sin, in dialectical contrast to this, as a sort of extended, albeit implicit, riposte to Swinburne's presumptions about the fall, and as setting, I think, the gold standard for a sophisticated metaphysical defense of Augustinian original sin as precisely compatible with the principle Ray calls MR, moral responsibility, viz, I quote, a person P is morally responsible for the obtaining of a state of affairs S only if S obtains or obtained, and P could have prevented S from obtaining, close quote. I will not repeat the details of Ray's complex argument here, except to note that he provides two different possible metaphysical pictures, neither wildly popular in current philosophical circles, he admits at the end, one inspired by Jonathan Edwards, the other by Molino, for rendering MR and DOS, the doctrine of original sin, logically compatible with one another. This is a heroic achievement in its own ten terms, but again we notice that a supreme good that is assumed to be in need of defense is a particular kind of modern rendition of MR, one that has supreme significance in the arena of the free will defense. Sin is not actually defined in reference to the biblical text in this article, or indeed at all, except in its, quote, original form as a kind of corruption that disposes us to evil. Very different again, and lastly, one might think, is Marilyn Adams' renowned attempt in her book, Christ and Horrors, her renowned account in that book, of the creation and fall as representing a problem of vulnerable embodiment rather than primarily a problem of sin or human error as such. Human non-optimality, as Adam likes to put it, resides in our embodied frailty, our necessary subjection to what Adams calls horrors, events such as would make any particular life not worth living. From this perspective, Augustine's rendition of the false meaning is certainly false. And, quote, even if Adam's and Eve's choices are supposed to be somehow self-determined, God is responsible for creating human beings in such a framework. Adam's account of the basic theodicy problem is thus obviously different again from Swinburne's and Ray's, and we shall shortly investigate if it, too, has any base in classic patristic theorizations of the fall. But the point here, once more, is that some version of the modern problem of evil is again the tail wagging the philosophical dog. Adams intensifies this problem under the category of horrors, to be sure, and in a somewhat heterodox fashion in which vulnerable bodiliness constitutes the main problem to be negotiated, not primarily sin as such. But what her account of the fall ironically shares with Swinburne and Ray is a presumption that the modern problem of evil is the fundamental issue to be negotiated, 
in and behind any story of the fall and the origins of human error or depravity. So much by way of something somewhat lengthy introduction. Now let me move to section two and see if there is any mandate for this set of presumptions. We must turn back to the biblical text itself. So this section, for those of you who don't have a handout, is called Genesis 3 to 4 and its paradoxes. What is sin and the relation to desire in the biblical text? What I shall be arguing here is that a true analytic theologian needs, in contrast to these existing discussions in analytic philosophy of religion, sophisticated and instructive as they are, to turn back first more probingly to the very mystery of sin itself as presented in the biblical text and its intrinsic connection to the category of desire, a theme which, along with sin, the analytic tradition of philosophy has to a large degree neglected to probe with any exactitude, at least until recently. I don't call sin a mystery unthinkingly here, because the first and central message of this paper is to urge that the story of the fall in Genesis 3 to 4 presents us with no unambiguous account of what sin is at its root, but is rather a narrative that acts as a kind of koan, the presentation of a set of irreducible paradoxes which must and should continue to tease the philosophical mind. In putting things that way, I acknowledge once more my indebtedness to modern theories of mythology which have pointed to the irreducible structures of myth for human meaning making. While structuralism as a wholesale explanatory project is now deeply unfashionable, some of the insights that Claude Lévi-Strauss brought to the study of myth remain, as already intimated above, hugely insightful, and by no means need to be read as implying that myth signals untruthfulness. On the contrary, myths express particular truths better than could be expressed in any other way. As Adrian Cunningham discussed long ago in a little book which still repays study, Levi Strauss's proposal that culturally sustaining myths are those that mediate contradictions in narrative form is of considerable significance for theological reflection in general and has special bearing on the fall narrative in particular, as I shall now attempt to show in what follows. The biblical story presents to us different and conflicting truths which appear unassailable to us, and yet have to coexist in seemingly unbearable tension. What is clear from the Genesis text, however, is that sin is something inexorably to do with desire gone wrong. Although the mystery already starts in Genesis 2.17 with a strange and unexplained prohibition from Yahweh <clears throat> not to eat from a particular tree under pain of death. And it is this point about the vicissitudes of desire that I now wish to explore hermeneutically albeit with some necessary brevity. What we should note first in returning to Genesis 3 for a moment unfettered by later Western presumption is that desire features even more significantly in the Hebrew text than our modern translations tend to pick up. Thus, in Genesis 3.6, in which Eve's initial temptation by the serpent is described, two words for desire are used in quick succession. I quote, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight, literally a desirable thing, to awa, to the eyes, and was to be desired, nechma, to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. The particular impossible contradiction inscribed here, it seems to me, is that the human capacity for such desire points simultaneously in two opposing directions. It is clearly already a striking feature of the human made in the image of God to have the capacity for such desire in the first place. And indeed, the further activation of that desire is strictly speaking required, if you think about it, for the human more fully to become that image or to grow into that image precisely by knowing good and evil and thereby acquiring the godlike capacity for wisdom and discernment even while sinning. Thus, in an important sense, desire is the mark of the paradoxical necessity of the fall, the felix culpa of which Augustine was later to speak so tellingly, and which other Western authors such as Anselm further ramified in a way we shall dis discuss 
below. In this sense, too, although Eve has in one strand of Christian tradition, in 1 Timothy 2 in the Bible, and later in Tertullian, you are the devil's gateway, already been marked out for particular projective blame, her striking initiative here is also, from another perspective, her distinctive desiring contribution to the necessary drama of salvation. Once the fall has occurred, however, a new gender binary becomes fatally fixed, woman to painful childbearing, man to endless toil, and Eve's desire is now characterized by a different word in Genesis 3.16, to shukar, which significantly appears only three times in the Hebrew Bible and seemingly connotes, though this is heavily disputed in the secondary literature, a kind of obsessive sexual desire for a man which is then met with a yet deeper demand by him for subjection. On this uh, riddle of the meaning of this word, see the important recent article by Andrew Mackintosh. It is surely not insignificant that this same word is used almost immediately once more in Genesis 4, 7, where the text rather curiously says of Cain's jealousy for his brother that, quote, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire to shukar is for you, but you must master it, close quote. Note that this false desiring inherent in sibling rivalry and violence in Genesis 4 is not the original form of sin, as some followers of Girard would have it, but a secondary spin-off, one linguistically coterminous with Eve's corrupted sexual desire. In other words, it is corrupted or misdirected desire of some sort that is the special mark of sin along with the disobedience to divine instruction that then follows, not original desire itself, which in its uncorrupted form appears to have a special work role in propulsion towards the divine, propulsion to consideration of the goods of the earth, and even propulsion towards a certain likeness to God. As a minority report in the rabbinical tradition also puts it, speaking of the mysterious Yetzer Hera, the evil inclination, which is used by the rabbis to further explain the mysterious original propulsion to sin in Genesis 3, I close, I quote, it is obvious that we have no strength to resist it. So let it be your will, Lord my God, that you vanquish it from before us and subdue it, so that we may do your will as your own will with a whole heart. It is instructive here to find such a remarkable parallel to Western Augustinian sensibilities in the rabbinic tradition. It would seem then that the nature of Eve's sin of disobedience, or more deeply, her corrupted desire, is also and paradoxically her particular phalix culpa, characterized by a desire that reaches out of and beyond itself, that is, precisely stretches out to God. Whereas the unambiguous sin is desire wrongly aimed, desire missing its mark or misaggregated in its attempt to grasp and control what it more appropriately should wait on as a gift. It is corrupted into obsessive sexual subservience on the one hand, or as in Cain's case, into jealousy and violence and projective blaming. When we ask finally then on this vision, who was to blame for the fall? The answer is, of course, from the perspective of mythic contradictions, deeply ambiguous. It was the serpent. It was Eve. It was Adam. And yet, underlyingly, it must have been God in God's self, who is, of course, ultimately responsible for the entire scenario. Yet the same God also behaves inscrutably by demanding an apparent unthinking obedience to his command while placing before Adam and Eve a potential good of enormous significance, the mature capacity for the discernment of good and evil, which it is indeed to become their due inheritance as made in the image of the divine. Moreover, the fruit of the tree in the Hebrew text is desirable, truly desirable. It is good to eat, and not merely apparently so, as some embarrassed patristic authors such as Gregory of Nyssa were later to aver. Further, while the story purports to explain the entry of sin into the world, it is clear that it is already there, at least potentially, in the form of the strange talking serpent, who himself also, after all, 
can only finally be the creation of the good creator God. Whilst rabbinic tradition was to counter-explain this third in, times, in terms of the Yetzer Hara, Christianity quickly, by the third century, had to reach for its own counter-myth in terms of the prior fall of the angels, which in turn drew on Jewish strands of thinking in the Enochian literature, and perhaps behind that in Genesis 6. Finally, and lastly, the threat of death stated as punishment for the sin of eating from the tree in the text is not, of course, actually carried out. Nor is it obvious that Adam and Eve would have been immortal if they had not eaten of it, since that possibility then becomes a further reason for expelling them from the garden. See Genesis 3.22. In short, I hope I'm confusing you, what we might call the theodicy problems spawned by the text of Genesis 3 are at least as extensive and troubling as those which it purports to resolve. As in any just-so story or Levi-Straussian myth, the text, when closely attended to, generates yet more irresolvable questions just as it seems to seek to provide an answer to them. But it has been precisely the burden of this section of the paper to insist that the holding of these unbearable contradictions together is what is irreducibly distinctive about this founding narrative on the origins of human sin in Genesis 3. And this, I submit, should not be an offense to the philosophical and theological mind, but rather an enrichment and a challenge to it. So we now turn to attempt a rough typology of classic patristic and scholastic responses to the Genesis narrative. As we shall see, their interpretations, unlike their modern analytic philosophical counterparts, did keep the problem of corrupted or voluble desire at the heart of the picture in a variety of ways. Rather than merely reducing sin to a failure in duty, Swinburne, or an offense to a morally perfect God, Quinn, neither of which definitions now look at all convincing in the light of the complexities of the text we have disclosed. But as for the divergent classic interpretations which I shall now survey, the irony is that they were merely, each of them, to spawn another set of paradoxes, mysteries, and theodicy problems. Let me now illustrate this point by sketching three very different classic renditions of the Genesis 3 narrative. The plot thickens. So, my next section, generating a typology of classic interpretations of the fall. Elaine Pagel's now classic treatment of the history of thinking about Genesis in the first four to five centuries CE, Adam, Eve, and the Serpent, draws a probably oversimplistic conclusion from her own complex account, which nonetheless still has some truth though we shall need to correct and modify it in what follows. I quote her. For nearly the first 400 years of our era, she writes, Christians regarded freedom as the primary meaning of Genesis 1 to 3 and self-mastery as the source of that freedom. With Augustine, the message changed. Now the fall became a story of human bondage, close quote. Why was this? According to Pagels, it was largely the result of the Constantinian settlement, always a good thing to blame, <laughs> such that after it, Christians had to reconceive their identity as non-martyrs in state terms, thus forcing conflict inwards. <coughs> but I'm not sure that this explanation helps to explain the notable divergences of, for instance, the near contemporaries Gregory of Nyssa and Augustine on the fall, both post-Constantinian, or the general and continuing divergence of East and West on some crucial issues in understanding human freedom and human sinfulness. Moreover, as we shall now expound, there was also a third, admittedly minority, report on the matter from a strand of theological reflection beyond the borders of the Roman Empire among the East Syrian, Syriac-speaking, faithful followers of the theological traditions of Theodore of Mopsuestia, your friend and mine. I'm married to a Syriac scholar, so this is where I get this stuff. <laughs> Let's look at these three possible interpretations in turn. They are, of course, selective, but their comparisons are instructive. First, what I've called embodied freedom tested in Gregory of Nyssa. Let me start with Gregory of Nyssa, 
As is well known, Nissen in The Making of Man reads Genesis 1 to 3 through a particular rendition of Genesis 1 27, broken into two parts. In the image of God, he created the human. Male and female, he created them. The initial creation of the hu human in the image is thus seemingly humanoid or angeloid for Nissen, while what we would now call the binary of gender comes into being only en route to the fall and ultimately, according to Gregory, will be transcended once more at the end of time. By the same token, what constitutes the image of God in the human is essentially intellectual or psychic for Gregory, not bodily or changeable. And unlike Athanasius before him, Gregory does not hear press to insist immediately on the image's Christological form, given the seriousness of the fall to come. As for the nature of the first sin and its explanation, Gregory is somewhat evasive in the making of man. He expatiates at some length on how the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil evidences mixture, mixes, or mixed knowledge in a beguiling sense. The fruit combines a divine good under the color and shape of that which stands for sensuality. And for this reason, writes Gregory, comes that desire which arises towards evil as though towards good. Again, it seems here as if the physical, or at any rate the sensual or passionate realm, is the prime problematic. There are shades of Marilyn Adams' revulsion against the physical here, perhaps. But in Gregory, it is not a worry about the vulnerability of the body, but about its sensual heaviness. However, in his The Categorical Oration, in contrast, Gregory looks at this issue from a rather a different direction. Instead of explaining the act of the fall in terms of mingled sensuality and goodness, as if the body and sensuality were primarily to blame as a downward tug, he points instead directly to an evil which, in some way, he does not attempt to explain it, arises from within. It has its origin in the will, he says, when the soul withdraws from the good. But why and how does this happen? At this point, Gregory does indeed seem to start to advance what moderns would detect as a version of the free will defense. I quote, since it is the mark of free will to choose independently what it wants, says Gregory, God is not the cause of your present woes, for he made your nature independent and free. In short, the fall narrative is more an indication of the risks of freedom than a collapse towards sensuality, let alone a tragedy of irreparable depravity as in Augustine. And the serpent's rather strange role in the story for Gregory is that of evidencing a primary sin of envy. I quote, he took it amiss that there should be produced a being to resemble so closely the transcendent dignity of God. Overall, however, although the image of God in the human is not completely or disastrously marred as a result of the fall, since our capacity for synergistic freedom endures, Nonetheless, sin is an enduring and distressing feature of post-lapsarian life, and our bodies are destined for death as a result of the fall. Complete restoration to participation in God and the renewal of good and endless ecstatic desire for the divine life, for which Gregory's later commentary work is justly famed, comes only through the powers of the resurrection. It's very important to note, however, that Gregory's account of synergistic human freedom contra Swinburne's inclination to treat him as a modern incompatibilist, involves a cooperation between divine grace and human freedom. Werner Harrison's excellent monograph spells out this exegetical point with care, and I note it on the handout. And thus the fall cannot in fact involve an autonomous human aseity altogether diremt from God's sustaining action. God is therefore no modern liberal as Swinburne would have him. Thus, as Richard Norris shows in one of his last and most brilliant articles on Gregory's understanding of sin and the fall in his late work, The Homilies on the Song of Songs, Gregory continues to tie himself into knots about the origins of evil right up to the ends of his life, and indeed, apparently, to make them worse. He still says that evil, which he takes with the majority tradition of early Christian thought to be insubstantial in comparison with the good, to be the result of the fruit's seductive mingling of opposites, sensuous and psychic. But now he admits that in effect, there is good even in this evil. The fruit is an apparent good, 
and thus an occasion for teaching us something. <coughs> Further, and even more intriguingly, Gregory now argues concomitantly, and I think he's the only exponent in the tradition to propose this, that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life are actually the same tree seen from different perspectives, since only one tree can stand right at the center of the garden, he insists. Such then is the paradoxical but close contiguity of good and evil at the heart of human desires. Ultimately, however, Gregory seems defeated by his own conundrum. As Norris puts it, the symbolic and allegorical intersection of the two trees precisely illustrates Gregory's, as Norris puts it, fruitless struggle with the question of the origin of evil. Since he takes it as read that human desire is basically and originally oriented to the good, the introduction of the idea of an intrinsic magnetism to evil finally flaws him as to its to explanation, except in so far as the seductive fruit represents a downwards tug to sensuality and materiality dressed up in its opposite. So the theodicy problems ultimately remain and arguably are even intensified. The good God is ultimately responsible for the temptation of the fall and the good God is responsible likewise for making a rotten fruit appear desirable. And the freedom that Adam and Eve exercise in being seduced by the fruit does not in any incompatibilist way excise them from the sustaining responsibility and providence of the divine. Finally flawed, Gregory has to admit at one point that the paradox of the two trees means that in a sense, good and evil are the same thing. This is a desperate ending point signaling Gregory's final bafflement at the ambiguity of human desire and its divine origins. Now let's try another alternative. I call it pedagogy and the adolescent human, Theodore of Mopsuestia and Cyrus of Edessa. In another strand of Eastern thinking about the fall, which was to be promulgated later across the imperial border into Persia, however, an alternative rendition of the fall story was being concocted, which focused precisely on what Gregory would only hint at, viz. the idea that the ambiguous stretching of desire in the act of temptation was precisely intended to teach Adam and Eve something. This is a little-known alternative Christian rendition of the fall, although it has a certain anticipation in Irenaeus's earlier suggestion in the West that Adam and Eve were adolescents rather than mature adults, hence their resistance to divine orders. <laughs> and it stands in the thought of Theodore of Mopsuestia, himself strangely alongside another account in his writings, which is much closer to that of the Cappadocians. Since we are partly reliant on later and fragmented texts from the sixth century Cyrus of Edessa for this unusual line of reflection, I here follow William Macomber's account of what Theodore's and Cyrus's second so-called pedagogical rendition of sin and the Genesis narrative amounts to. The argument runs thus, to put it succinctly and in Macomber's words. Whereas the traditional Eastern view began with an initial happy state that is disrupted by, disrupted by sin and deteriorates progressively with time, this alternative rendition of Theodore and Cyrus begins with a state of radical imperfection that improves under divine action with the passing of the ages towards better things. In this conception, man, though ultimately destined to attain a state of immortality and sinlessness, could not have been created thus in the beginning because he would have been incapable of appreciating this inestimable gift and of giving due thanks to God for it. <coughs> For whereas God alone knows by his essence, created natures by intrinsic necessity can only learn by contraries. And hence, without an experience of sinfulness and death, they could never learn to understand and appreciate sinlessness and immortality. Indeed, if we had been created immortal and immutable from the beginning, we would have been no better off than, quote, a pearl of comely beauty that is unaware of its own splendor and is not conscious whether it is fixed in the crown of a kim, king, or whether likewise it is set in a camel's saddle, as Cyrus puts it. And hence, we, had, we would have derived no profit from these priceless gifts. Thus, in this view, whatever gifts Adam may or may not have received in the beginning, he was radically imperfect, because he lacked the capacity to appreciate and benefit from the most important of the gifts that God intended ultimately to bestow on him, 
and whenever he knew would be the best and man would be able to receive them. The school of Theodore thus developed this pedagogic theodicy with remarkable acuity and originality. Simply, however, and bemusically, bemusingly, setting this account alongside their other and opposite rendition, rather as the rabbis also allowed the collocation of contrary interpretations in their distinctive contestations of meaning on Genesis. But we do not find evidences of the pedagogic model being developed in any sustained and philosophic form here. Moreover, while the suggestion of this minority pedagogic strand apparently solved one central theodicy problem, the divine permission for the existence of evil, it by no means dispelled others. Did God want Adam and Eve to sin then, or only to be tempted? How was this a higher order good exactly, if and when they did sin, and so unleashed the consequences on the world? How could that then lead to a confidence in their final perfection, and so on? We shall come back to these questions shortly in the form of Anselm's closer philosophical treatment of something like them. But meanwhile, we turn thirdly to Augustine, whose rendition could scarcely be more different from Cyrus's. Here is no pedagogy of ascent, but a dramatic and ineradicable descent into erotic enslavement. So, more familiar territory, original sin in Adam. Augustine's vision of the effects of the fall are, of course, also notably contrastive with Gregory of Nyssa's. And not the least interesting feature of this divergence is the picture of gender that is a crucial part of them. Unlike many contemporary feminist commentators, I am not disinclined, I am disinclined simply to besmirch Augustine for his various renditions of the binary of gender, which have complex and rich features, not in any case wholly consistent between the different accounts he gives in the literal commentary on Genesis, the good of marriage, the De Trinitate, and the city of God. And in more than one of these texts, he shows a considerable interest in protecting women from male violence and violation. Yet there is no doubt that Augustine's interpretation of Genesis 2 and 3, solely his own, has had unparalleledly um ambiguous implications for women down the centuries in the Christian West. And this is integral to his theory of the fall, not a mere coincidental accompaniment. The most important point for our current purposes here is that unlike Gregory, Augustine holds that distinctively different maleness and femaleness, the female subordinate to the male, are intrinsic parts of the original unfallen state of the human, as too is enacted sexually, which is nonetheless wholly good insofar as it is rationally conducted and procreatively fruitful. We find this in the City of God, book 14. There was sex in the garden, but it was rationally controlled. What goes wrong in the fall, therefore, is a new sort of servitude or subordination of woman to man as a result of it. Although she was already, pre-fall, appropriately subject to her husband, Augustine of Vers, yet now, quote, there is a condition similar to that of slavery rather than a bond of love. This is subjection gone completely awry, see his literal commentary. And note that this involves close and accurate attention to the reflections on desire in the biblical text, as already outlined above. Yet seemingly, this subjection occurred because Eve was on her own, unable to resist the seduction of the serpent. The reason for this, perhaps, Augustine is not, not dogmatic here, but he alludes to the problems of 1 Corinthians 11, as he does too in De Trinitate, is that the image of God is not directly attributable to Eve, but only indirectly and secondarily via her husband, Adam. So she was not up to resistance to sin on her own and cannot ultimately be blamed. Adam, in turn, however, falls not because he is sexually seduced by Eve, since until after he has fallen, sexual temptation is not a problem for him, though then it becomes an overwhelming problem. Rather, he does what Eve asks because, this is rather charming, he did not wish to make her unhappy. Just as Augustine <laughs> notes... We too can offend God just to keep the attachment and affection of friends. Adam's primary problem then, when confronted by God as to his disobedience, is not at this point concupiscence, but pride. He blames Eve instead of acknowledging in humility his own complicity in sin. <laughs> 
Now, where Augustine does, of course, most markedly diverge, not only from Nissen, but from the majority Eastern tradition, is in his rendition of the Greek of Romans 5.12, Adam in whom, in quo in Latin, all sinned, misunderstanding the Greek epho, as a result of which. And his theory of the inherited and indeed sexually transmitted effects of Adam's original sin, a position intensified towards the end of his career by the effects of the Pelagian controversy, is one of the most problematic aspects of his theory. The fall becomes then for Augustine a literal event which inexorably and biologically changes the course of human history. Freedom is radically and inexorably and universally undermined by the cacophony of internal compulsions towards concupiscence and libido canalis. I name on the handout a wonderful article by Bill Babcock for a rich account of the tortured diremptions of desire in Augustine. The human will has no power of freedom to resist such evils, except and unless it freely accepts the offer of divine grace. And the only freedom on offer is paradoxically a complete submission to the workings of that grace. At first blush, then, what the comparison of Gregory of Nyssa and Augustine on the fall illustrates is how radically divergent two interpretations of the defensely complex yet compelling Genesis narrative can be. On issues of gender and sexuality, on the identification of the prime sin, whether it be envy or pride, on the question of how original sin is, tra and is transmitted. For Gregory, as a Platonist, sin is merely a perennial problem for the Platonist human, rather than a sexually transmitted disease. And above all, on the nature and extent of human freedom, Gregory and Augustine are, in response to these conundra, seemingly poles apart. And yet, I submit, underlyingly, there is a most interesting congruence between them, and it is in the realm of the fundamental role of desire in the face of sin. Not only in the fall itself, but in the further grace-filled outworkings of the Christian life post-salvation. For both Gregory and Augustine have rich and complex understandings of such desire, as we have now seen. Both read desire as ambiguous, labor, labile, open both to corruption, especially sexual corruption in Augustine's case, and to the interruptive propulsions of divine grace also, as the Christian continues to stand in that inexorable tension that Paul so vividly described in Romans 7. As James Wetzel has shown, even during the last throes of the Pelagian controversy, Augustine is still unexpectedly recasting his theory of grace to allow the reordering of desire, specifically, as the prime crucial place for renewed divine intervention and enactment of true freedom. God has to get at desire to fix this. At the same time, his theory of prayer in his later life, too, simplifies into sheer advice in the lovely letter to Prober, to desire and go on desiring happiness. That's what prayer is for Augustine, desire happiness. <coughs> Gregory, likewise, had ended his career with two commentary works, The Life of Moses and The Commentary on the Song, which equally manifest an intensified interest in unending desire and its insatiable ecstatic propulsion towards God, both within this life and beyond it. But neither Gregory nor Augustine ever solves the fundamental mystery of the fall. That is, neither can ultimately explain the primal sin. And of this mystery, both men become vividly clearer towards the end of their lives. As Jesse Cohenhoven concludes in a fine survey article on Augustine on sin, in the new wonderfully named T. and T. Clark Companion to the Doctrine of Sin, <laughs> you must all buy it. I quote, Augustine famously found the primal sin inexplicable, just as Gregory before him manifestly had. For all their philosophic and interpretative ingenuity and insight, certain of the original impossible contradictions inherent in the biblical nar narrative, viz. the very emergence of sin and evil in a world created by a good, loving, all-knowing, and all-powerful God, and moreover, through the seductive exercise of a serpent also created, created by this same God, remained. Further, as I have now demonstrated, Nissen did not moderate this problem by any appeal to a modern incompatibilist view of freedom. Both men, though again differently, saw human freedom as sustained only within the matrix of divine grace, whether 
synergistically or deterministically. <coughs> it might thus seem hugely paradoxical, at least to the modern analytic mind, to argue that the contradictions of the Genesis Fall narrative are best resolved, as I'm going to argue, by a divine providential compatibilism rather than by a human incompatibilism. But that is the idea that I'm now going to presume and defend in my last section, along with, I might say, the majority Western scholastic tradition, however out of fashion. God has an atemporal divine plan that undergirds, but does not compete with, the exigencies of individual human choices. Brown Davis's lovely little book on Thomas on Evil is, I think, the, the most beautifully clear exposition of this and defense of this position in Thomas. For by now, we have begun to see that the modern incompatibilist alternative is not only completely under-narrated by the biblical text and its classic commentators, but itself leaves the central theodicy problem strangely untouched. For why would God grant us incompatibilist freedom in order precisely to distance us thereby from his grace and guidance? However, in order to fill in the remaining mystery that neither Nissen nor Augustine could finally solve in their own compatibilist terms, we need now to confront more directly the problem of why and how a higher order good could arise from the very undergoing of temptation itself. That possibility only briefly sketched in the East Syrian rendition of its paradoxes, but scarcely allowed by Nissen or Augustine. Here, it seems, lies our central remaining philosophical aporia and possibility. And this is where, perhaps surprisingly, our own Western Anselm of Canterbury may surprisingly help us. Now, so far, I've been gabbling along, and you've been putting up with this, but I'm going to slow down for the final denouement. <laughs> One proposed solution, Anselm's De Caso Diaboli as a test case for the education of desire. We come back here too, of course, to the other connected and underlying problem that besets all renditions of Genesis 3, both Jewish and Christian, from the outset. How was evil already present in the form of the serpent at the start of this story? As mentioned earlier, already from the time of origin, Christians solved this appeal, so-called, by referring to a meta-story that of the fall of the angels prior to the story of the fall in Genesis. That, of course, only replicated the aporia of Genesis 3 at a higher level. But Anselm was not an exception in following this tradition. Yet he probed further than others had, and further that even Aquinas would later, into the mystery of what this proto-fall might mean. I'm constrained by time at this point, but the argument in this marvelous little text runs roughly thus. And I thank Bill Wood especially for some recent and rich discussion of its meaning and philosophical implications. Crucial transitional moments in this text note occur at sections 11 to 14, 18, and 28. And some in this text clearly wants to give as clear an account as possible of how evil came into the world in the first place and how the fall of the devil, backing up one level from Genesis 3, is ultimately responsible for this and indeed gives us the blueprint of how sin subsequently exercises its power in humans. However, he also takes it as read, with the majority classic tradition, both East and West, that evil is insubstantial. He thus has to explain, in a characteristic dialogue between teacher and student, why an angel would make such an insubstantial bad choice in the first place. The argument from sections 11 to 14 runs thus and attempts to probe this mystery in the way that perhaps echoes, but, is, but in considerably more philosophic and incisive mode, the earlier pedagogic suggestions of Theodore of Mopsuestia and his followers. First, Anselm repeats his conviction, quote, that evil and nothing can be shown from their names to be a something, but only a quasi-something. And then, quote, that the angel cannot have its first act of willing from itself. And moreover, if it had only the will for happiness, it could neither will anything else nor not will it. And the will, whatever it willed, would be neither just nor unjust. And it would be the same if the angel were given only the will for rectitude. It is because it was given both that it can be just and happy. It follows section 18 
that the bad angel makes himself bad and the good angel makes himself good, and that the bad angel owes thanks to God for the goods he received and abandoned, just as the good angel does for what he retains when he has received it. Paradoxical as this may seem, therefore, Anselm concludes right at the end of the text, quote, that the power to will what is unfitting was always itself good, and willing itself is good insofar as it exists. What are we to make of this? We are perilously close to Nissen's bemused insight that good and evil somehow converge, or perhaps more radically to Julian of Norwich's much later insight that sin is somehow behovely in the good providential intentions of God. For what Anselm seemingly wants to insist upon, and it is crucial to his own theodicy, is that God wants both angels and human creatures to be as close imitators of the divine nature as is possible and appropriate for their status. And one central dimension of this is the capacity to make real but compatibilist moral choices, the first fruit of the tree of the discernment of such. So God gives the angels genuine moral choice according to this compatibilist model within the orbit of his timeless providence, as he later too does for Adam. And along with that go all the desires and dispositions appropriate for making such a choice, the desire for justice and happiness, for instance, as well as the precious ascetic gift of perseverance. Without the possibility of that choice, however, Anselm argues, neither angels nor humans are genuinely themselves in God. That is both the risk, in a rather Pickwickian sense, admittedly, within this compatibilist model, and the moral dilemma. Without this potential for disaster, even as still caught in the providential workings of the divine note, something crucial is lost, the capacity for genuine moral agency. God remains good, however, even in presenting this choice, for evil is ultimately insubstantial, and the good of the pedagogic training of desire outweighs the evil of the potential for the corruption of it. It might be objected, of course, that Anselm has merely recreated the same irreducible paradox of freedom, desire, and divine providence, as is already present in the Genesis narrative itself, and therefore taken us around in another fruitless circle. But this, I think, is not quite right. Not only does Anselm's assumed metaphysical scaffolding assure that insubstantial evil will in no wise ultimately triumph, least of all on account of the salvific workings of the incarnation and its logic about which he urges elsewhere in the Cordeus Homo. But his compatibilist understanding of angelic and human freedom in God also keeps even our bad choices ultimately within the divine providential purview. As Brown Davis and Gillian Evans put it in their introduction to the Oxford version of this highly original text, focusing again on the crucial issue of desire as rendered by Anselm, I quote, Anselm argues that what Satan did wrong was to desire something, to be like God, which was in itself a good thing, but which he wanted to a degree not possible for his created nature, high though it was. So his fault had to do with wanting something good, but in the wrong way or to a false degree, a breach of what Anselm calls the rectus ordo. The ambiguity of desire and will, then, lies at the heart even of this final theodicy account. But the resolution, even within a remaining mystery in relation to divine providence, insists on the final goodness of God's permission of angelic and human sin. Let me now conclude, and with a brief philosophical coda. (laughs) Let me now sum up very briefly what I have argued in this paper and indicate in closing how some recent new stirrings in analytic philosophy suggest that our theological debates on this topic of sin have fresh cultural actualitate or relevance. First, I argued that the irreducible paradoxes of the Genesis 3 story are an essential part of its power and should not be diffused too quickly, as some analytic philosophers of religion have notably attempted to do. To stay with these impossible contradictions 
is pr precisely the name of the philosophical and theological game in relation to Genesis 3, with which we should continue to be engaged and by which we should continue to be goaded, intrigued, and even annoyed. Secondly, I showed by a rough threefold typology of classic theological attention to these paradoxes, and of course that typology could be extended, that the Christian, and also behind that the Jewish tradition, has evidenced no one univocal response to Genesis 3, but a pluriformity of insights that also should continue to exercise us dialectically, both philosophically and theologically. Finally, by suggesting a certain amalgam of insights from these different strands of tradition, and by keeping focused on the centrality of the problem of desire and freedom, I have proposed a reconsideration of a neglected te te text of Anselm's, which I think goes some way not to dissolve the ultimate mystery of divine providence in the face of evil, which of course must remain, but to probe the significance and of ascetic testing of desire according to what Anselm calls the rectus ordo. This, I have argued, creatively constitutes a second account of a Felix culpa on the fall, alongside that one which points forward to the incarnation itself. And, accompanied by a high scholastic account of freedom as compatible with divine providence, and a view of evil as real but insubstantial, goes some way to resolve or ease a number of the dilemmas inherent in the biblical text itself. In closing, let me also just note by way of a little coda, that in the ongoing contemporary analytic debates about the nature of intentionality, freedom, and responsibility, where some really interesting stuff is happening at the moment, you know, agent causality is making a comeback, some new voices are currently being heard which precisely return us to the problem of desire, a topic long neglected in analytic circles. Whether it be Talbot Brewer's incisive challenging of what he calls the three dogmas of desire in analytic philosophy, according to a merely propositional account of its significance, and he then goes on to draw on Gregory of Nyssa and Augustine in that wonderful article, or John Hyman's very different and indeed Herculean rendition of the fall as an ascent into freedom, the classic theological deposit of reflection on the nexus of the desire, reason, and freedom is seemingly surprisingly back in vogue philosophically. It is time for us analytic theologians, therefore, to stretch our muscles further and to engage fully with these interesting new philosophical developments. What they witness to, after all, is the ineradicable significance in Western culture of the myth of the fall and its mysterious and disputable account of the nature of human sin in relation to human desire and divine providence. To continue to probe this mystery, I predict, will remain a central responsibility of the analytic theologian in crucial ongoing debate with secular philosophy and classic theological resources. Thank you for your attention. We have some time for questions. Um, we're videotaping this, so I'm going to, what I'll do is call on you and bring the microphone to you. Um, there's a lot of people and a short period of time, so please keep the questions snappy. Um, an easy question on the Genesis narrative. It seems to me you leave out entirely in the early part of Genesis 3 the doubt and intellectual dimensions of the fall and move too quickly to the issue of desire. What do you make of that sort of like turn to, well, did God really say all this? As a way of sort of sowing deep doubt about the goodness of God, which in fact elsewhere in Genesis. Which is particular crucial. text do you? Can uh, the you, can the you... early part of Genesis 3, in the early part of the fall. I have my Bible here. Do you want to? <laughs> do you want to read? <laughs> um. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from the tree in the garden? Is that, is that it? Okay. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the tree in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
Do you see that as, how do you re represent that? As somehow intellectual and not desiring? Or, I mean, it's a, it's a tempter's voice, right? It's, it's, it's a seductive voice to draw the woman into intensification of desire towards the freedom. No, I, I see it as, as, a, as an absolutely fundamental questioning mm. of the goodness of what God wants for them. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's a profoundly intellectual dimension of mm -hmm. what happens in the fall, sure. which seems to me logically distinct from the issue of desire. Um, well, I think one of the interesting things about this text is it's very difficult to untangle desire from intellect, <coughs> precisely because it's by the seductive whipping up of desire that that intellectual be point becomes so attractive. So there are, of course, many uh, representations of this in the tradition which don't attend to the desire and fully attend to the intellectual part. But part of what I want to argue is that they're actually... Um, fully entangled right from the start, and that's why, that's why the serpent is so enticing. Um, and the serpent is enticing also because, objectively, the fruit is desirable, as it goes on to say. Yes, um, I'm wondering if you have engaged with any of like contemporary or 20th century orthodox thought, like Lowski, mm -hmm. who talks about uh, the story as a question of, of impatience. And it seems to me impatience and desire might be intertwined and even connect to this latest yeah. point, if, mm -hmm. if you could comment to that. I can't remember, where does, what does he do with that notion of impatience? Um, I have read this in the past, but I mean, why, why does he, I mean, that's not obviously in the text, but he has an impetus for this Yes, I mean, right? the, the argument uh, briefly is that uh, being created in the image and likeness of God is the promise, mm -hmm. not the problem. It's not mm. the temptation, it's the goal. Yes. And that you should pursue that through the ruling and subduing right. over a period yeah. of educational yeah. time yeah. Yeah. Right. rather than jump to it to try to do it our way right. through the temptation. Does that help? Yeah, it does. And it's interesting because there's a little bit of a strand there of that, um, that alternative Eastern yeah. view um, that, um, yes, it is a good and you are going to get it. But the problem is how you might get that getting wrong. So he calls it impatience. Um, other people see this as a misordered um, a desire to grasp which, what only God can give. But I think that's, you know, it, that's a, a reasonable hermeneutical gloss, although I don't think it's actually in the text. It's another sign of our desperation to explain why on earth what is obviously a good is prohibited. Right. It seems to be the desire and that narrative. Yeah, it goes nicely with it, yes. I'm going over here, but can I get a sense for the hands that are going to go up over the next 30 minutes? Just, <laughs> to, just so that I don't just pick the ones that come immediately to view. Okay. I mean, you can still put your hands up if you come up with a question. <laughs> did you intend to hand this to me? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, it did, right. very much so. All right. Um, Professor Coakley, thank you for this immensely learned lecture. You mentioned earlier um, Augustine's construal of F. Ho mm -hmm. in Romans 5.12 mm -hmm. as the equivalent of in quo. Mm -hmm. I just want to observe that. Anyway, in essentially Augustinian understanding of original sin is in no way inextricably intertwined with that which I no. consider also a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. For Phocius, mm -hmm. I mean, for instance, um, conceives of FO in Romans 5.12 as the equivalent of in quo mm -hmm. without reaching thereby sure. anything like an Augustinian understanding of original sin. Yep. Whereas Calvin is, and his successors they were forthright about rendering FO as because. Yes. Yeah. Nevertheless, from Romans 5.12 through 21, they get a very Augustinian account of their measure in your I apologize, mm. original sin. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's very fair. By the way, um, quite what constitutes original sin is a bit smudgy in the, in, in the discussions, I find, because there's a very learned long article on, your, on the handout about Gregory of Nyssa in this regard by a, a Jesuit writing uh, in the neo-scholastic days, and he's trying to bring Gregory of Nyssa into line with a, with a Western view, and he points out, I think, 
convincingly that because Gregory is underlyingly a Platonist, he, he assumes that everyone will, qua human, do exactly what Adam did, right? It's just that he doesn't add the, um, the extra element that this is on account of sexual transmission. Um, so there's more than one way of thinking about original sin, and I think sometimes we're confused when we say that's only Augustine's view. Um. Um, I wonder, this is another question about Genesis, though. Yeah. Um, I thank you for your wonderful lecture, by the way, and loved it. But um, I wonder if you might want to, to find a place in your thinking about Genesis and this, the corruption of desire, for the desire and its corruption to grow over time and to spread mm. and become deeper so that the intellect, too, is corrupted. Mm. And so that you don't really get a full original sin corruption of the human being until Genesis 6, mm. where, you know, just to remind you, starting in verse 5, and God saw the wickedness of the human being mm. was great on earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is stronger than for Cain, where the metaphor is it's crouching like a wild animal and yeah. desires you, but you could still master it. Exactly. That's not possible <laughs> no, in Genesis no, no. 6. Yeah. And so God's desire actually changes, and God repents and grieves of having created Exactly. No, so that's lovely, yeah. I think you, you see the intellect and the desire also together, but becoming <laughs> co-corrupted by the deepening of the effects of this corrupted desire. And, uh, you, and according to one strand of tradition, the... Nephilim um, in, in uh, Genesis 6 are, are the, the fallen angels, the fallen angels. So, you know, that, uh, so, and that goes into the Nokian literature and then Origen picks it up in, in a more Platonist form. Now, that, that's very nice, a nice joining of dogs. Thank you. Sarah, I'm so grateful for your lecture, uh, extremely illuminating. And I, I don't know if my question is an impossible one, so feel free to say that. <laughs> The question is this, how do you as a philosopher or Anselm or anyone else decide how heavy <laughs> a, a horror is? So you talk about mm -hmm. this, this goodness is an outweighing thing mm -hmm. compared to the corruption. How do you decide how heavy being tortured to death is if you've never been through it? Or how do you weigh that against the good that's there? Yes. All right, I'm in very contested territory now, as you know, um, in which huge emotional reactions occur when um, people like Swinburne reach for the higher order goods argument in, in response to horrors. I will admit, though, that I'm someone who doesn't think that horror is a distinct category. I don't think, I don't, I think it's an emotive category. It's summoned by horrible examples but, um, you know, hacking off people's limbs and raping them and so on and so forth, and then uh, defined as that which makes life not worth living. But in my experience as a priest particularly, there's no knowing what does and does not make life worth living for people. Some people have a very minor experience of abuse as a child and their lives are wrecked forever. Other people go through Job-like um, uh, undertakings and emerge glowing with faith. So there's something, there's something about the category of horrors that actually, Parche Adams, I actually am suspicious about. Now, um, I, can we distinguish between the pastoral issue of sitting beside someone dying of inoperable cancer and taking their hand and saying, let me tell you about the higher order goods theory, <laughs> which would be obviously utterly ridiculous and, 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 and repulsive. And the broader metaphysical framework in which we really have the choice to make decisions about how we see the world as whether fundamentally ordered to the good in God or not. And I have made a commitment along with this great, you know, Augustinian scholastic Western tradition and indeed the Eastern tradition as well to the idea that evil is ultimately insubstantial. It's not unreal. It's insubstantial compared with the good. And um, thereby I, you know... I place my faith. And so these questions ultimately um, come back to metaphysical commitments. Um, and I think we mustn't be um, destabilized in making choices about these metaphysical conditions by 
truly ghastly pastoral situations to which we should respond with deep empathy. Do you see what I mean? Hi, Dr. Coakley. Um, thank you for a terrific talk. Um, I was wondering if you could say more about desire. You sort of gestured at the end about desire in contemporary uh, philosophy. I have analytic training myself. Um, and, but you're also appealing to classical stories, stories uh, scholastic, scholastic and philosophy that's from the heyday of classical theism. And their um, moral psychology in some ways is very different from what, how we look at moral psychology now with okay. improved understanding of neuroscience and so on. So I was just wondering if you could say more about how you would see desire factoring into moral psychology and as it being distinct necessarily from bodily passions or somehow necessarily interwoven with that and sort of the effect of valence by which we evaluate things. How do you see that playing out possibly? Yes, that's an enormous question. I've been running a most wonderful uh, seminar in the last two and a half years with colleagues from London and Oxford and Cambridge University in which we've been looking at the whole history of the notion of desire and philosophical discussion and theological discussion, starting with Plato and, you know, we've just about arrived at Schopenhauer when it all starts getting very nasty. Um, <laughs> not to speak of Freud, but um, if, if a short answer to you would be to say that I am... The, I think the most sophisticated person in the tradition on this is, is, is Thomas. And he didn't feature in this lecture because there wasn't room. But his understanding of how the way desire operates as a fundamental um, um, propulsion towards, towards the good, um, and then how it um, is, uh, as it were, mediated bodily in other forms, um, involves a, a, you know, a very complicated analysis of different kinds of desire and how they are related to, to intellect and will. Um, and I think you're aware of that tradition. I think that is probably the most illuminating and sophisticated tradition that we have in the West. And it's quite difficult to, um, to translate it into um, post-Freudian terms, frankly. But the great merit of the Freudian tradition is it opens up the realm of what we now call the unconscious. And I think that's where the illuminations um, of the contemporary period are, are most interesting and demand to be somehow um, included in a more scholastic account. Sorry, that's rather shorthand, um, but it gives you an idea of where I want to go. Hello, thank you uh, very much mm -hmm. for your lecture. Um, you started off w um, looking at some of the analytic discussions so far and, mm -hmm. and, and really told us, showed us how, how libertarian freedom has in some ways um, constrained their treatment of this mm -hmm. issue um, and then you seemed yourself to really propose a compatibilist view instead mm -hmm. and Divine so compatibilist. yeah and I'm wondering if the implication of that <coughs> is that actually a, a theology of, of desire is almost impossible with a strongly libertarian uh, view of freedom I'm wondering if that's an implication you're willing to push at no I wouldn't go that far um, I, I mentioned briefly at the beginning that Actually, Richard Swinburne, for one, is one of, one of the few analytic philosophers of religion who does spend a lot of time on desire, on the evolution of the soul, um, on the more evolutionary dimensions of his argument in responsibility and atonement. But, um, so it's not absent from his account, but in my view, he falsely presumes that desire is fundamentally bodily and delivered from our evolutionary ancestors, and therefore um, uh, interested in selfish reproduction. Um, this is informed by a slightly out-of-date evolutionary theory as well, because he doesn't take into account the countervailing propulsions towards um, sacrificial cooperation, which is also delivered to us evolutionarily. But I think it's not terribly surprising that there's a rather anemic or unsatisfactory theory of desire there. And that's why I find it so interesting that someone like Talbot Brewer, I do recommend to you this wonderful essay, Three Dogmas of the Desire, it's sort of echoing um, Quine, um, you know, goes, is going out to bat now to, re, to rescue from the theological tradition what he calls ecstatic views of desire, which he thinks have been completely obliterated out of the analytic 
uh, repertoire in virtue of propositional views of desire. And this, to me, is a very interesting and rich development. So it's undeniably been the case that there hasn't been much on this. Um, but I think that's starting to change for whatever cultural reasons. And I hope that the theological traditions will now be, as it were, thoroughly rummaged through for nuggets of wisdom. So, thank you so much for your lecture. So I, I'm surprised by the fact that you never mentioned Cyril of Alexandria here. <laughs> because you know, Cyril of Alexandria writes a commentary on to the Romans, where he says very different things from what Augustine says, because you know, he says that we all are sinners in Adam, but not by being co-transgressors with him, but by sharing his nature, mm -hmm. because through him we became subject to corruptibility and the passions entered in. Mm -hmm. So you know, he goes in a very different direction mm -hmm. from Augustine, mm -hmm. and there is a whole tradition of Eastern Orthodox theology that uses Cyril as a sort of paradigm for this theology of ancestral sin or proper economa martima sure. that perhaps is set up even too much in opposition to the Augustinian version. So, I just wondered whether you thought that Cyril's theology was useful or... Um, I think I th if, I, if I had um, world enough and time, I would extend the typology very extensively. And I was very aware of that Alexandrian tradition as not being represented. I made one allusion to Athanasius. So I think we need a bigger typology. For the purposes of this lecture, I set up my dialectic in order to bounce from it into Anselm, as you probably noticed, I was capaciously received by his. <laughs> um, but one could very significantly extend it. And somebody else who definitely needs to be there is Maximus. Someone else who definitely needs to be there is um, Gregory Paulus, who in his work in the Philokalia has uh, most fascinating reflections on the ontology of desire, even in the Godhead. So there's more to be done, and maybe you'll do it. <laughs> Thank you. Sarah, can I invite you to return to the microphone? Oh, sorry, yes. <laughs> the wandering, uh, <laughs> sorry, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Coakley. Um, I'm over here. Oh, hi. hi Who there. is it? Is it somebody I know? Yes, there I am. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, uh, I've got a question about James chapter 1, uh, yes. and desire and temptation and sin. Mm. Um, in light of what you said, I like how you point out how the birth of sinful desire is sort of ambiguous and not explainable and how that's significant for what it is. Do you think James chapter 1 describes um, the mechanism of sin, temptation, and desire after the fall, or do you think it has, uh, it's describing a universal human condition? This is just how sin works. Um. Did you say Genesis chapter 1 or James? James, yes. Yeah, that's particularly interesting um, because, if I recall, that's where uh, James says uh, God would never test anybody, right? Is that what you're after? Yes. Um, and, uh, I mean, we don't have a university of perspectives on this, clearly. But I think what James is saying there is God would never test somebody in a way that would be bad for them. I mean, that's how I would get off this hook. Um, in that uh, it, Anselm doesn't explicitly respond to that text. I, I wake up in the night worrying about it, but I don't think Anselm did. Um, but I think if Anselm were to respond to it, Anselm would say, um, this is a testing that is for the ascetic good. It's not a testing that to defeat us or to undermine us in our humanity. But jolly good question. Sorry, I've, I've been told to clarify by this person. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's the, it's the verse that talks about um, desire being conceived, giving birth to sin, and sin giving oh, birth that to one. death. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, and it seemed, I don't know, I suppose overly analytical um, compared to what you're recommending, I suppose. I don't get you, I'm afraid. Can you explain yeah. further? Well, is, it's, it's explaining how desire and sin interface in a very mechanical way. Mm -hmm. And one way of explaining that would be that it's... Uh, it makes sense after the fall, after we've inherited a sin nature, which makes sense of evil desire. Mm, mm -hmm. But I wonder if it works the same way in the first instance of sin. Hmm. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily see that as mechanical. Um, I see it as, um, you know, extending a line of thought on the relationship between desire and sin. Um, but... Unfortunately, because the text is not itself attempting to be systematic, um, it's a bit hard to say, isn't it? But um, I'll put that in my pipe and smoke it. Thank you. 
<laughs> Hello, thank, thank you very much for your talk. I, um, my, my question is a bit stepping back in terms of the question seems to be trying to interrogate why there is evil in the world mm. at all, and mm -hmm. that there's something about asking that question that's trying to find something intelligible about the existence of evil. Mm -hmm. And I um, uh, haven't looked into these questions with a huge amount of detail, but I'm <laughs> taken with the idea, I can't remember where I run into it, that to be intelligible is a good thing, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that to try to find an intelligibility yep. in the order in yep. the origin of evil is not like we may be able to find a number of edifying mm -hmm. things about it, yep, but the good. satisfying answer is not something we can get to. Is that something in no. the early tradition? Do you find it compelling? It's implied. Or? It's implied actually, both in Gregory of Nyssa and um, and um, I think there's a strand of that in Augustine, but certainly in Gregory of Nyssa. Mm -hmm. So um, because evil is in, insubstantial, then you wouldn't expect it to have a rational quality that you could explicate. Mm -hmm. um, and hence the surd. It is in a way a surd. And perhaps you should just stop there and not attempt to explain it further. Mm -hmm. And that's one possible response. I mean, I think actually in a way that's what the paradoxes of, of, of Genesis 3 leave us with. Mm -hmm. So one is on dangerous ground, you might say, if one with Elm you know, dares to go a bit further um, and to say, well, there is a rationality in the good that allows this space for evil, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. And so you sort of slightly shift the way you, you project that question. But that's a very clever and, and important point that you've just made, and it's one I need to um, at least footnote here, I think. Thank you. <laughs> I wondered if in your work, um, listening to you again today and your, all your work on desire, mm -hmm. are you of the mind that temptation is actually necessary for the taming of the good mm -hmm. or the ordering of the good for the human? Therefore, that's part of what, in some sense, you want to regain or remind us of in mm -hmm. Genesis 3, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. then would link to things like Deuteronomy or even Jesus' temptation in Matthew. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and I wonder if you could comment on that as linked to desiring yes. and restraint. Yes. Um, this is to leap forward something I hope to do much later on in the last, the last volume of my systematics. But yes, I want to see the ascetic um, struggle with desires um, as precisely the, the arena in which we grow into the good. And this is I mean, deeply... Um, significant in the Bible in Jesus' own temptations. It's deeply significant, as Maximus above all showed us in his last struggle in the garden. Um, and it's not something that he avoided, um, qua human. Um, so I think um, when I get to that point, um, I'm going to bring, Thomas will be, will be pleased, because I'm going to bring a lot more <laughs> um, uh, uh, Greek material in, both from Evagrius, who is the great, you know, cartographer of desire in the monastic tradition, um, and from Maximus um, and his account of Christology. Yeah. This will be our last question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Hi, Alan. Um, thank you, Sarah. And um, do you think human, or human evolution is an ongoing process? And if so, do you think sinful desire might belong to the fabric of that? Just a little question there. From <laughs> um, okay, first things first. I actually am somewhat uh, resistant to simply blending e the evolutionary story of human development in with the Genesis 3 narrative without some very significant limbering up qualifications, which I won't bore you with now, but we can do over the drink, which I'm dying for. Um, <laughs> however... Um, I am indeed open to the thought that uh, there is a history of the evolution of the human capacity for good and evil. It is not inexorably upward tending as Darwin thought in his Victorian melioristic way and as the events of the 20th century have manifestly shown. But I do think that there is a cultural history of the understanding of the depths of the capacity of the depravity of the human and of the capacity for ecstatic good which actually is potentially able to grow. And as a result of my work on evolution, which is a completely different story from what I've been doing today, I think that the capacity for cooperation in humans has to grow exponentially if we are to confront 
uh, worldwide certain challenges which we clearly have to confront at this point in the history of the cosmos. Otherwise, uh, ecologically speaking, we're not going to have the cosmos much longer, and nor are we going to be able to confront the cataclysms of war and violence which we, const you know, which we currently perceive. So Christian hope, a belief in the ultimate metaphysical goodness of the good over the insubstantial nature of evil, is absolutely crucial for not giving up in the light of such challenges. Um, and I do think that culturally this is, this is potentially possible. We have the IT capacity now for international corporations of a sort that we never could have had in previous generations, amongst other things. <laughs> Please join us for food and drink next door, and now let's thank our speaker. Thank you.